I'm going to share with you a message that is very near and dear to my heart, especially as we are a people moving quickly toward the coming of Jesus. I want to invite you to stand to your feet for the word tonight. And we're going to go in our Bibles to the book of Matthew chapter 7. Matthew chapter 7. And we're going to look together at verse number 15 and we'll skip throughout the chapter. Matthew chapter 7 and verse 15. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. Matthew 7 and verse 15. Y'all not tired, are you? Amen. Matthew 7 and verse 15. Again, a message that I try to share as often as I can for those who are awaiting the coming of Jesus. Matthew 7 and verse 15. Again, when you arrive, say, Pastor, I'm ready. The Bible says, beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. And he says, you will know them by their what? By their fruit. Do men gather grapes from thorn bushes or figs from thistles? Even so, every good tree bears what type of fruit? But a bad tree bears what type of fruit? A good tree cannot bear bad fruit, nor can a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. Therefore, by their fruit will you know what? them then jesus says not everyone who says to me lord lord shall enter the kingdom of heaven but he who what does the will of my father in heaven and then in verse 24 is where we'll settle tonight therefore whoever hears these sayings of mine and what and does them i will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock and when the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. But everyone who hears these sayings of mine and does what? Does not do them will be like a foolish man who built his house on the sand and the rains descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it fell and great was its fall for emphasis i'm going to read verse 24 therefore whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them i will liken him to a wise man who built his house upon the rock tonight saints for just a little while i want to talk to you under the subject the power is in doing. Tell your neighbor, the power is not in hearing it. It's not in saying it. It's in doing it. Let's pray together tonight. Father, I pray that you would grant me permission to attach my human weakness to your divine strength. Father, we have gathered here tonight, not for form or fashion, not because of ceremony or tradition, but Lord, we need to hear from you. And so, Father, we pray for a rare and distinct visitation of your spirit. Lord, I pray that you would give me strength to preach the word, but then give your people the faith and courage to hear and act on the word. So, Lord, would you hide me in the shadows of the cross that Jesus alone might be seen, that Christ alone might be heard, and at the end of our time together, may Jesus alone be praised. Bless us to this end, we ask. In the wonderful name of Jesus, let those who believe say together, amen, amen. and amen. You may be seated in the house of the Lord. Again, talking to you on the subject, the power is in the doing. You know, saints, about... I guess about 15 years ago, there was a fitness craze that raced through the United States. Fitness guru Tony Horton 
came up with this 90-day muscle-building, fat-burning program, and he simply titled it P90X. And what made it different, at least in theory, is that it was supposed to be holistic in nature. You would get these exercise videos. You would get protein shakes. You would get a uh, dietary guide. You would become a part of a fitness community. And saints, I remember convincing my wife that if she let me pay $200 for this program, that she would see a thin, lean version of her husband. And saints, I want you to know that I watched these videos very carefully. I read the instructions repeatedly. I listened to the testimonies intently, but I'll be honest with you, I came up a little short on doing the exercises themselves. And the strangest thing is, church, I didn't lose any weight by watching them exercise. I didn't get stronger by just reading the instructions. Having my name on the roll profited me nothing. And the crazy thing is, I saw what I was supposed to do. I read what I was supposed to do. I said what I was going to do, but I got no benefit because I didn't actually do it. And I guess, saints, what's true in the world of fitness is also true in the world of worship. Because the truth is that we come to church and hear what we're supposed to do. We read the Sabbath school lesson and study what we're supposed to do. We come and declare what we're going to do. But the reason we leave unchanged is because we don't actually do it. And I guess what I'm saying, saints, is that there is no power in saying what you're going to do. There is no strength in listening to what you ought to do. You get no benefit it until you actually practice it or put it into doing. Are y'all hearing me tonight? And so go back with me if you don't mind to Matthew chapter 7. Here we find Jesus concluding what becomes known as the Sermon on the Mount. And though the sermon recorded is only three chapters, Ellen White says that this sermon was the length of an entire day. And yet the people sit there spellbound, not wanting to miss a single syllable that falls from the mouth of the mouth. Master. In other words, this word is like finding an oasis in the middle of the desert. And even though they are hungered, they sit still and they are fed by the word that comes from the mouth of Jesus. And as Jesus brings this sermon to a close, he begins to make a distinction between multiple types of believers. First, he makes a distinction between those who cry Lord Lord and those that do the father's will then he makes a distinction between those that hear the word and those that put it into practice and in summation what Jesus is teaching us is that there is no power in lip service just talking about the word and there is no power in observation just listening to the word there is no benefit until you put it into practice and see Jesus knew that there would come a time where the church would be real good at hearing and affirming the truth but where we would struggle is living and putting the truth into practice in other words Jesus is saying there are a lot of amens in in church but very little doing after the benediction but it would be better if there were less amens in the church and more doing once you got home in other words I need you to know what good is it for you to hear a message on forgiveness if you gonna hold a grudge against everyone that's done you wrong what good is it to hear a message on the last days if we're going to live as if Jesus is not coming in our lifetime? 
What good is it to hear a message on family if you're going to go home and talk down to your spouse and kids? What good is it to hear a message on health if you're going to stop by Kentucky Fried Chicken on your way home tonight? In other words, friends, there is no power in just hearing it. God doesn't apply power to observation. God applies power to activity. Oh, okay, let me say it this way. I, I remember a while back, friends, I was going uh, to visit one of my sick members. I live in Huntsville, Alabama, but this member lives in Pulaski, Tennessee. It's about an hour and a half from where I live. And so I drive way up into the mountains and down this dark country road. And when I get to her home, there are no lights on on the outside or the inside. And, and when I begin to get out of the car, I get a little bit nervous because the grass comes all the way up to my thighs and I'm one of those brothers that has a bad relationship with snakes do I have a witness tonight and, and so now I'm a little bit nervous about pushing through all of this grass because there are no lights on the inside or the outside and so I called the house and nobody answers and I call again and no one answers and so here I am an hour and a half away and it looks like I'm not going to get to pray for anyone and so now I've driven too far to go back home and so I've got to pray for somebody and so I begin moving toward the house and as I get there there to the edge of the house a light comes on on the corner of the house when I get down the sidewalk another light comes on the sidewalk and as I walk up the porch another light comes on the front porch and then it becomes clear that she has what you call a motion detection system and see a motion detector is where they have a sensor that applies power once it recognizes recognizes the presence of activity in other words as long as I was standing in the driveway no power was going to be applied as long as I was making phone calls no power was going to be applied no power was going to be applied until I started acting on the mission that I came there to do and see how many of us know that we serve a motion detecting God that doesn't apply power to intention he applies power to activity when you start acting in obedience to what the word has spoken are y'all hearing me tonight friends and so friends of mine we into this text this evening uh, we've been talking a lot about the need to act on the word and obey the word but I want to be clear that we are not saved by our doing we are saved by the amazing grace of Jesus can somebody shout amen tonight uh, but I don't think that we ought to ever come to a place where obedience becomes taboo in the church but as you look at this text, I want you to notice what we read there in Matthew chapter 7. I need you to notice how Jesus frames our doing or our obedience. Did you notice that he frames our doing as fruit and not seed? In other words, your obedience or your doing is the fruit that identifies the tree. It is not the seed that produces the tree. In other words, my obedience, friends, is not the seed that produces my salvation. It is simply the fruit that identifies me as being a good tree. In other words, friends, your obedience is not for the sake of salvation. Your obedience is for the sake of identification. In other words, it is your deeds. They don't save you. They are simply the evidence that you are already being converted by Jesus Christ. 
And, and in other words, friends, Jesus lays out the criteria because he knew that uh, in an agrarian culture that lay people would not know a tree by its roots or its leaves. The uneducated will only know a tree by the fruit that it bears. In other words, as a non-farmer, to me, all trees look about the same. They all have limbs. They all have leaves. They all have roots. But I only know the type of tree that it is by the fruit that it bears. Where y'all at tonight, church? In other words, I only know a mango tree when it has mangoes on it. I only know a plantain tree if it has plantain on it. I only know a cashew tree if it has cashews on it. I only know an apple tree when it has apples on it. I'm not wise enough to tell by the leaves or the roots. I can only tell what it is by the fruit that it bears. Why is that important? Because Jesus is giving a criteria by which you can know which believers belong to him. Because he knew there will come a time in the last days where all Christian trees would look the same from the surface. In other words, we all got Christian roots. We all have Christian leaves. We all have Adventist limbs. But you got to have some spiritual fruit. Are y'all hearing me tonight? In other words, we all sing the same songs. We all read from the same Bible. We all worship on the same day. But God says, you don't judge those who belong to me by church attendance or how well they wave their hands or how many verses of the hymns they know by heart. You'll know those who belong to me by the fruit that they bear. Are you hearing the pastor tonight, friends? And see, I need you all to understand something that is very powerful tonight because it shows us that when we begin to develop some Christian fruit, how many of us know that none of us get the credit? Okay, let me preach to you all on this side. In other words, whenever a tree bears fruit, did you notice that nobody ever credits or celebrates the tree? In other words, they, they celebrate or credit the one who planted it, the one who watered it, the one who pruned it, the one who dunged it is the one that is celebrated because no tree bears fruit of itself. Its fruitfulness is the result of somebody's labor. And what I'm saying tonight, Jamaica, is that when you begin to show some fruit in Christ, you don't walk around around patting yourself on the back because how many of us can testify that you didn't plant yourself you didn't water yourself you didn't prune yourself you didn't dung yourself that your fruitfulness is the work of Jesus Christ in you not the work that you've done on your own behalf in other words when you begin to grow stop walking around and saying I got the victory you didn't get the victory you were given the victory by the Lord Jesus Christ and see it shows us something very powerful friends because I need you to know that walking in the spirit or living as a believer is not as hard as we sometimes make it in other words, bearing fruit is not the result of effort. Bearing fruit is the result of connection. When is the last time you've seen a pair on the limb stressing, pressing, working hard, trying to become? When is the last time you've seen a fig sweating and working hard and laboring to become? No, as long as that fruit is connected to the branch that's fed from the sap that comes from the root, as long as it stays connected, it's 
being is a byproduct of being connected. So it doesn't have to work hard to become. It's just got to work hard to stay connected. Y'all missed it tonight. In other words, in order to be a believer, it's not about how good you are. It's not about how hard you work. It's about how connected you are to the true branch, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And how many of us know that if you abide in him, and his word abides in you. The word says that the same shall bear much fruit. And how many of us understand and can celebrate the fact that your fruitfulness is not based on your goodness or your badness as long as I'm connected to the root and the offspring of Jesse, I can be fruitful in the Lord Jesus Christ. And see, beloved, I need you to understand this critical piece tonight because what the word is showing us is that, man, both righteousness and unrighteousness are not the result of effort. They are simply the byproduct of what's planted there. I mean, see, I need you to notice what Jesus says. Notice what he said. He says a good tree can't bear bad fruit and a bad tree cannot bear good fruit in other words he lays something out as an agricultural impossibility and shows it forth as a spiritual truth as well but the problem with the contemporary church is that we've created a dynamic where a person can have all bad unspiritual nasty mean fruits and still be considered a good tree but the devil is a liar. No, the Bible says a bad tree cannot bear good fruit. And a good tree cannot bear bad fruit. And I need us to understand whatever type of fruit you bear is simply a reflection of the type of seed that's being planted. In other words, if you got good seeds, where y'all at tonight, church? You're going to have good fruit. If you've been born of the imperishable seed of the word of God, guess what? You're going to have the fruit of the spirit. There's going to be love and there's going to be joy and there's going to be peace and there's going to be long suffering and temperance and self-control. The fruit that is born out is going to reflect the seed that's being planted there. And see, I need us to understand the reason walking with God feels hard is because sometimes we bring our own conflict. Has walking with God or your walk with God ever felt like this? One step forward and three steps backwards. Where there is a cyclical element to it. Where forward progress is hard to maintain. And the reason it's difficult is because sometimes we bring our own conflict to the situation. It's because we try to plant seed that's not compatible in the same stretch of the heart. In other words, we try to start the day before the throne. But then we end the day with Game of Thrones. We, we start the day with living water, but we end the afternoon with the tea of gossip. Y'all mighty quiet tonight. Where we start the day with the morning hymns, but we end the day with our calypso. Y'all, y'all mighty quiet this evening. In other words, we introduce our own conflict to the scenario where that which we introduce in the evening dilutes that which we plant in the morning. And we wonder why it's so hard to make progress. It's because we're trying to occupy in both worlds. But I need you to know religion is not hard. It's only difficult when you try to merge two spaces that are fundamentally incompatible. Are y'all hearing the word tonight, friends? Listen, I had a farmer that attended my church once, and he said, Pastor, one of the things I'll never do is he says, I'll never plant, uh, when I'm planting corn, I'll never plant my heirloom or natural corn seeds too close to the genetically modified seeds. He says, I'll never plant my, my melons too close to my cucumbers. And he says, the reason I'll never plant them too close is because of what they call cross-pollination. He says, if the pollen from the genetically modified corn 
gets on the natural corn. He says it will convert the natural corn seed. And the natural seed will take on the color and the texture and the taste of the fake or genetically modified seed if I plant the two seeds too close together. And see, the reason we have spiritual cross-pollination is that we have been born again of the natural seed of the word of God. But then we try to plant the seeds of this passing world in the same heart and what happens is the spiritual seed gets converted and even though we were born of the spirit after a while we look like the world and taste like the world and sound like the world because we're trying to make something agree that should always be in opposition are y'all hearing the word tonight friends and so the word says to us that Jesus now begins to make the distinction between a hearer and a doer and he does it in terms of results. He says those that hear the word, I will liken them, are y'all still with me church? To a wise builder who when he goes out, he does not put his money in finishes, but he puts his money in infrastructure. He does not build on the surface of the beach, but he digs deep until he strikes bedrock. And his house may not be as outwardly opulent, but it is firm because it is built on the foundation. And he says there's going to come a day when the rain falls and the wind blows and the floods rise, but the house is able to stand because it is built upon the rock but then he says those that hear the word but do not put it into practice I will liken him unto a foolish man who finds beachfront property but does not put his money in infrastructure he puts it all in finishes he's got designer tiles and specialized carpet and he's got man unique windows and he's got all types of things that look good but the problem is that he built his house upon the surface he did not dig deep until he found a solid foundation but the problem is one day the rain fell the winds begin to blow the streams begin to rise and the Bible says that that house fell and great was its fall why because it was not built on a strong foundation and I guess what I'm saying to somebody today I need you to notice this that both houses go through the same storm. In other words, building on the rock did not cause the storm to pass by. Building on the rock simply gave him the infrastructure to be able to withstand the times of storm that are inevitable for us all. Are y'all hearing the pastor tonight? See, see, how many of us understand that serving God doesn't make you exempt from storms? Ah, can I go so far as to say that serving God doesn't make you exempt from storms, but sometimes serving God is going to guarantee some storms. I need you to look with me in your Bible for just a moment because the first thing this shows us is neither your prosperity or your adversity reveal your standing with God. All right, go with me in your Bible. Go over two chapters, Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 45. When you get there, let me hear you say amen. Matthew chapter 5. And verse 45, I want you to see some things in your Bible tonight. The Bible, Maxie, verse 44, but I say to you, love your enemies and bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you and pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be sons of your father in heaven. For he makes his son to rise on the evil and on the what? And he sends rain on the what? Just and on the what? 
unjust. I need somebody to hear tonight that the Bible makes it clear that it's going to rain on the just and the unjust. So go with me if you don't mind. Psalm the 34th division. And I want you to look with me at verse 18. Psalm 34 and verse 18. I promise I won't be here much longer. Psalm 34 and verse 18. They're in the Old Testament. I need somebody to develop some axioms around trouble so that end times troubles don't destroy your faith. Psalm 34 and verse 18. Matt Frack, let's look at verse 17. When you get there, say, Pastor, I'm here. The Bible says that the righteous cry out and the Lord hears and delivers them out of all of their what? The Lord is near to those who have a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. Watch this. Many are the afflictions of the lukewarm. Many are the afflictions of those who love not God. Are y'all seeing this church? The word says many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivers him from them all. Did y'all catch that tonight, church? In other words, I need you to develop a different barometer for how you uh, measure the closeness of God in your life. You see, sometimes we operate under the faulty assumption that if our all is going well and there is money in the bank and health in my body and a man or woman on my side that somehow God is pleased with me and he's close to me and he loves me and when things are awry and things are uncomfortable that somehow I have been forgotten by God or that somehow I'm under his curse and his censure but what I need somebody to know tonight is that God loves you as much in the storm as he does when every circumstance is ideal in your life see I need somebody to know that your relationship with God is not based upon circumstance but it's based upon connection. And see, there are some of us that feel like it's unfair that I have to go through things even though I pray and I go through things even though I serve and I go through things even though I give. How many of us understand that the Bible never promised that you would be kept from all trouble? The Bible promised that you would be kept in all trouble that you go through. And see, I need us to know, as, as one author says, what makes life fair is that it's unfair to everybody. In other words, serve God is going to be hard. If you don't serve God, it's going to be hard. But you don't serve God to avoid the hard. You serve God so that you have an anchor that grips the soul to keep you from being bantied about and blown back and forth by every slight, every difficulty, every season of discomfort that is not just likely, but it is inevitable for all who believe on the name of the Lord Jesus. And what I'm saying to somebody tonight is that you got to have a foundation. Are y'all hear what I'm saying tonight? And one of the things I do want to pause and say and the reason you got to understand this is because not all of Job's friends are dead. See, this is a call away from trying to judge people's righteousness by what they go through. In other words, where does it say that all who live godly in Jesus are going to only have good days, good weathers, harvest, breakthrough, and deliverance? No, the Bible says many are the afflictions of who? The righteous. the righteous. In other words, I need you to know that the righteous get sick too. 
that spiritual people get cancer and praying people lose jobs and praying people's cars break down and spiritual people's roofs start leaking and godly people get divorced and godly people raise stupid kids and godly people sometimes get talked about and godly people at times get slandered and godly people have to sometimes see a doctor where did it say that the godly will only have good in fact the bible says that all who will live godly in christ shall suffer persecution in fact jesus said this to his disciples he says in this world you shall have tribulation but fear not for i have overcome i've overcome the world and what I'm saying to somebody tonight and one of the things I've learned friends of mine is that sometimes when you're going through a difficult season sometimes we ask the wrong question but what I've learned saints is that when you ask the wrong question you get the wrong answer see sometimes we want to know why I'm going through it but I need you to know that even if God told you the why in the present, it would not make the difficult any less difficult. You don't need to ask why. You need to ask where does my help come from? Man, pastor was just like this. I remember growing up uh, as, as like, you know, around fifth or sixth grade, I was a decent swimmer, but I wasn't a very strong swimmer. And I remember going to my auntie's house where at her apartment, they had a pool now. And these uh, more modern pools, it goes very gradually from like three or four feet, a gradual slope down to the deep part. But I don't know if any of you remember those older pools where it would go from five foot, it would be one big step. And before you knew it, you were all all the way over in 12 feet and so I remember I was there playing on the edge of the pool and I'm showing off for my friends and trying to maybe impress a girl on the side and I'm hanging out there on the edge and before I know it I've drifted over into the deep end and it's crazy because I'm not strong enough to be able to maneuver in the deep end too long. So what I do is I just dog paddle just enough to be able to keep my head above water. Now I need you to know that when I'm in the deep end, I don't really stop and ask myself, why am I about to drown at 11 years old? Why are my nostrils and lungs filling up with water? Why am I not gonna make it to see the seventh grade? I didn't stop and ask why I was drowning. I just got my head around far enough to look up to the lifeguard's chair and cry out to the lifeguard for help. And what I'm saying to somebody who's drowning tonight, don't sit around asking why. You just got to stay above water. You've got to learn to look to the hills from whence cometh your help and realize that your help and my help I said our help it all comes from the Lord are y'all hearing me tonight friends second thing I need you to get real quick and I'm almost done and you've heard me say this ample times because I need the last day church to understand it that serving the Lord or obedience it doesn't make you storm free it makes you storm proof see some of us have been praying the wrong prayer too many too often we're praying for the Lord to make us storm free and see, the reason we want to be storm free is because we operate with such narrow spiritual margin that we have to have everything go just right in order for us to abide in Jesus Christ. Now, I'll be honest with you tonight, friends. I'm not one of those folks that goes looking for storms. I don't covet storms. But guess what? I'm not running from them either because I'm growing in my faith in such a way that I've got some spiritual infrastructure that allows me to be anchored when life turns against you. And see, I just need to say this, just like the old folk would say it to us coming up. I need you to know that if you align yourself to be dissuaded and bantied back and forth by these little, what Paul refers to as light afflictions. The old folk would ask this question, uh, according to the prophet, that if you can't walk with the foot soldiers, 
what you going to do when the horsemen show up? If you allow in every little person that doesn't speak to you or says something bad about you or the nominating committee don't elect you, if you allow that kind of junk to run you out of the church, then you don't stand a chance when those four angels that are at the four corners of the earth are removed from their duty and the real winds of strife begin to blow upon this earth. And one of the things that this story teaches us, friends of mine, is that not all storms are created equal. So I need you to know that this is not just one particular element. I need you to know that this particular storm in Matthew 7 represents when life converges on you all in the same season. See, if it had just been rain, the house would have been straight. If it had just been wind, he probably would have been okay. If it had just been a little flooding at the base of the hill, he probably would have been okay. But the issue is that the rain falls, which causes the flood to rise, which gives strength to the wind when it begins to push upon the house. In other words, it would be nice if there was only one element of difficulty at a time. But how many of us have been in the spiritual warfare long enough to know that the enemy of our souls, Satan, that he is not considerate of your feelings it would be nice if he let you get through one trial and get a prison of rest before he sent the next trial but how many of us know that the great adversary of your faith has no ethics to his warfare he does not fight fair he will send the rain and the wind and the floods in the exact same season of your life anybody ever went through one of those seasons of life where everything hits the fan at the exact same time. I'm talking about that season of life where, man, as soon as you lose your job, the same time uh, when the roof starts leaking, at the same time, your children start getting in trouble. I'm talking about that season when things are not well in the marriage. At the same time, something is wrong in the health. At the same time, things are not well at church. I'm talking about that season in life where your mom or your dad gets sick. And because they get sick, you have to take off from your job, which adds financial stress to your home at the same time that your spouse starts acting crazy. And even when mama dies, those same siblings that were not there to care for her while she leaves lived, want to fight you for the few pennies that she left behind. I'm talking about that season when the rain falls and the wind blows and the floods rise. And I need you to know the good news is this. You would think that if there were three different elements that Jesus would provide three different solutions for both the rain, the wind, and the floods. But for all three difficulties, there is one solution, a strong foundation. And what I'm saying to somebody tonight is that if you have a firm foundation it does not matter how many elements come against you in a said season you've just got to be anchored in the Lord and have Christ as your foundation are y'all hearing me tonight friends you cannot build your life based on finishes. See, the problem with the foolish builder is he put his investment in finishes, things which could be seen with the eye. But nobody wants to put their money in foundation. Neighbors are not going to be impressed by the foundation. Your home is not going to be making it into a, a, a magazine because it's got a nice foundation. People are going to be looking at the shutters and the carpet and the paint and the uh, tiles and the shingles and the double door and the two floor foyer or lobby and see the problem is too many of us are building our houses for display and not durability so my whole life is built upon creating this exterior facade that is designed to impress people into thinking that I'm smarter than I am and wealthier than I am and happier than I am and I put my whole investment in finishes to impress people that we don't even like 
with things that we don't even have. And God is saying, you've got to stop trying to live to impress man. And you've got to stop putting your investment in reputation and put your investment in character. Do I have at least seven folk tonight who have gotten to the place where you ain't trying to impress nobody? You ain't trying to please nobody? You don't care what nobody says? When Jesus comes, you just want to hear him say, well done done good and faithful servant are y'all hearing the word tonight and i need you to just number three realize this third thing and i'm done is i want to get you to a place friends where you learn how to redefine your victory you see i need you to understand that the victory for the wise builder is not that he was storm free it's not that he was rain free. It's not that he was cloud free. You know what the victory for the wise builder is? And it's a victory that some of us have that we have under acknowledged and under celebrated. The victory for the wise builder saints was simply this. That once the storm ceased... Once the clouds went into remission, once the light of day began to break, you see the victory for the wise builder is that once the smoke settled and once the dust cleared, once things came back to normal, the victory for the wise builder is that his house was still standing. Oh, help me Holy Spirit. The victory is not that he avoided the storm. It's not that he eluded this difficult terrain. The victory is that after the storm sent rain and wind and flood and sent them in concert to attack at the same time, the victory for the wise builder is that when trees were knocked down and other houses were knocked flat, he was able to look and celebrate the infrastructure that was made and his house was still standing because it was founded upon a rock. Somebody missed their shout tonight. You see, somebody will only shout when you're cloud free or rain free or storm free. But I need four or five blood washed, fire baptized, founded on the rock saints that can just rejoice that because when life hit you with everything it could hit you with, you you are here tonight at camp meeting and you can say I'm still standing by the grace of the almighty God you can say I've been in the hospital but I'm still standing my kids have left the way but I'm still standing I've been touched with sickness but I'm still standing I've gone through a divorce but I'm still standing we've had had some miscarriages but we're still standing the allies are many the enemies are many but I'm still standing I've been up I've been down I've been almost level to the ground but as long as I got King Jesus I don't need nobody else is there anybody that's had some loss but you're still standing You've been talked about, but you're still standing. You've been slandered, but you're still standing. They didn't think you were going to make it, but you're still standing. And maybe there's somebody who's saying, Pastor, it's not true. I'm not still standing. But I heard the word of the Lord, and I'm going to get back up again. Do I have some folk who can say, I will bless the Lord? at all times and his praise shall continually be in my mouth my soul will make its boast in the Lord the humble shall hear thereof and be glad oh northeast Jamaica would you magnify the Lord with me and let us exalt his name together it's been hard it's been tough you weren't certain you weren't sure but you ought to just say God I praise you 
that I'm still in my right mind. I praise you that nothing has separated me from the branch. I praise you that I'm still fighting the good fight and running the good race. I'm going to put those things in the past behind and press on to those things which are before. And the reason I wanted to spend a little time here tonight, friends, is because if we're going to be ready for the coming of the Lord, you can't just have last day truth. You got to have last day faith. We will have to trust God in a way that no generation has had to trust him since the days of the apostles. And it's funny, it's going to be a shock to the system because we have been rocked to sleep by the lukewarm lullaby of the Laodicean comforts of life that have made us rich and increased with goods to the point where we feel like we have need of nothing. And see, friends of mine, this is why even though no trial is comfortable and no trial is good and no trial is something necessarily in, in the moment to be celebrated, but you ought to thank God for these early trials. Because remember, see, see the storm did not strengthen the house that was built on the rock. All it did, all the storm did was reveal where folk had been building. And see, we walk around and we say, man, trials build character. No, they don't. Your response to trial is revealing to you whether you live in your life for finishes or whether there's enough infrastructure to help you abide the time of trouble that shall be unlike any other time since there was a nation. I'm talking about that time of trouble that the prophet to the remnant church says is going to be so dark and so great that some of us will see the very travail of our souls and we'll wonder whether or not God has forgotten about us. And what I'm saying to somebody tonight is of what the Bible describes as light affliction has us all shaken up and ready to stop praying and ready to stop believing and ready to leave the church. We are not ready for the times of testing that will come upon the entire world. Are you hearing me tonight, friends? And what I'm saying to us tonight, friends of mine, is we've got to get rooted and grounded and settled and cemented in Christ in a way that is beyond culture and tradition or that which is convenient. I want to end this sermon. Uh, gone are the days where I can get by with just a little five minutes of Bible study. No, saints, you need to be opening up the scriptures and sitting before them at times for hours. Going line upon line and precept upon precept. Here a little and there. Are y'all hearing the pastor tonight? Do you realize that we are coming upon the age where Satan will work with all types of lying wonders and every form of deceit so much so that he will transform himself as an angel of light. Deceptions and delusions so strong that Jesus says if it were possible the very elect would be deceived. I'm talking about beyond the season where oh I just pray and, and fall asleep by the bedside. No I'm talking about getting deep down in prayer. Pray until your knees hurt. 
praying and just getting lost in the spirit and, and, and just learning how to call upon the Lord, not just with the hopes that it's going to happen in one day or two, but you learn how to push where you pray until something happens. Are you hearing what I'm saying, church? I'm talking about to the place where in the contemporary church, and maybe this is more stateside than here, where people will come for a sermon, they'll come for a concert. But whenever there's a space where the Bible is opened, or it's just time to pray, saints can't be found. Sabbath school's dying. Prayer meeting is dying. And as one author wrote it, if you want to know how popular uh, the, the pastor is, go to the divine worship service. If you want to know how popular the singing evangelist is, go to the concert. But if you want to know how popular Jesus is, go to prayer meeting. Talking about a generation that quotes what the pastor said. More than we quote what the Bible says. Well, I'm saying, well, we got to get back to committing large portions of scripture to memory. So that in those times where we have to stand up and give an account, uh, uh, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit will bring back to your memory. But he can't bring back what has never been planted there. Friends of mine, I don't know about you. gone through too many hurts too many sorrows too many hells in this life to miss out on the eternal promise that God has made to those who love him and when I talk about going deeper in prayer and deeper in the word I'm not talking about trying to study your way to salvation or pray your way to salvation what I'm talking about is making sure you form a deeper connection with the branch and the deeper you are tied in and grafted into the branch, the more fruitful you will become, the more rooted you will be, and you'll be able to meet Jesus, not hoping or believing, but you'll be able to say like the apostle Paul, I've run a good race. I've kept the faith and I know that there is a crown of righteousness laid up for me and not for me only, but for all who long for their appearing, his appearing. There are too, much, too often when I ask the question and I say, church, are you saved? You know what the problem is? We have to think about it. There is too much ambivalence in the house of God. Too much uncertainty in the house of God. Why? But the Jesus gave us very clear criteria. He who hath the son hath life and he that hath not the son hath not life so when I say are you saved you ought to say yes in Jesus but you got to be rooted connected firm steadfast unmovable always abounding in the work of the Lord knowing that your labor is not in vain on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Father, tonight, my prayer for your people, both those in person and those who are watching online, is that there would be a radical shift in priority. That we would prioritize less finishes, things that can be seen, and ultimately things that will fade away. Lord, I pray that you would help us to make heavier investments in character that we might have the needed spiritual infrastructure to withstand the seasons of testing that are destined to touch us all. So Father, I'm praying for this encampment 
that we would not just save the spiritual energy for the 7 p.m. service, but that we would be in the word early in the morning, the middle of the afternoon. I pray that this mountaintop will be transformed like unto the place of transfiguration, a space where the glory of God is being revealed. Father, I'm praying that whether we are here in person or whether we are online, that this encampment will be one where the spiritual trajectory of our lives is changed in an eternal fashion. Lord, I pray for the young amongst us that you would get us to the place, Lord, where we not try to create a merger between world and heaven. But Lord, help us to not experience spiritual cross-pollination, but help us to only abide and plant good seed in the good ground. And we know, Lord, that if we do that, we'll bear good fruit. So, Lord, I'm asking in a special way that we would not be frightened or intimidated by the message, but help us to simply know that if we are connected, all of the fruitfulness that is ours in Christ is attainable to those who simply abide in you and allow their word to abide in them. So, Lord, would you bless us not just in our hearing of the word, for, Lord, we realize that there is no power in observation. But Lord, our power is in participation. So Lord, may we not just leave and say it was good or it was bad or it was for me or if it wasn't. But Lord, help us to act on what was said. That we might be like that wise man who built his house on the rock. Bless us. Keep us. Strengthen us to this end, we ask. In the mighty name of Jesus. Let those who believe shout together, amen and amen.